You're back with The Nation. When Adam Feely took over the role as head of the Serious Fraud Office more than three years ago, the fallout from the financial crisis was well underway. His office has spent much of its time investigating failed finance companies, bringing a number of high-profile prosecutions and winning. Feely finishes up next month and he's moving to Queenstown for a job at the District Council. I spoke with him earlier this week and began by asking him why the SFO reveals immediately when it's investigating a company rather than wait until charges are laid. I'd like to start, if I could, um, Adam, by reading uh, a quote from an article that was written about a year ago by uh, Fran O'Sullivan. You may be familiar with that article. She wrote, uh, Adam Feely's reputation is that of a self-promoting gunslinger who shoots from the lip. Uh, and she went on, she said, there's been growing dismay within his own office for some time over the way SFO staffers have felt themselves compromised by their boss's cavalier approach. And I'd like to touch a little bit more on that cavalier approach. Why is it that the SFO announces, as in the case with Hawkins Construction recently, that it's investigating, when at that stage nothing has been proven? I think there's a very good reason for that. We, we made a decision quite early on to um, lift the profile of SFO, and it's very much about lifting the profile of SFO and of people's awareness of financial crime. Um, if people do not see law enforcement happening, then they can't have confidence in it. Um, we have always been very careful to walk a line between not talking about evidence, not talking about individuals, but giving people confidence that issues of concern are being looked into. But it's a suggestion there straight away almost of guilt, isn't there? That's a conclusion that some people may draw and, and you know that's an unfortunate thing but if we investigate a long lengthy case and deny the fact that an investigation is going on then I think we're kidding ourselves in a country the size of New Zealand that people aren't aware of it. We think it is more responsible to say Yes, we are investigating it. There is a complaint, and we're not talking about the details until we make a decision it's whether to charge or not. It's very difficult, though, isn't it, then, for these companies to carry on tendering and doing business in the case of Hawkins Construction? Yeah, that came out publicly. Uh, sorry, I need to be qu quite clear. In that particular case, we issued no press statement. Uh, it was publicly known that we'd served search warrants. We simply confirmed that the warrants had been issued and made no further comment on that. So there is, you're absolutely right, where it is a live company, it's incredibly important that we don't make the first comment on it. But if there is public awareness as it is happening, we will confirm that and nothing more. OK, I'd like to talk about Hanover too. That's been a big investigation. We've been investigating since 2010. We haven't seen uh, any charges, any prosecutions yet. When are we likely to see those? Well... <laughs> I mean, just, just, just as you've um, pointed out, it's not appropriate us, for us to go into the details of a case. And we are, we are conscious. It's a though, isn't it? It has been it, going it, it, on it for a while. So. Um, look, we, we've said all along, the level of public interest in Hanover is so great uh, for whatever reason, and, and there are many reasons that that level of interest is there. We're going to get it right. We're going to put all the resources, and we have put all the resources into it that we, we need to. Um, when, I, look, when will I, I, that be, do you think? When will that time frame be? It's... I had hoped it would be concluded before I moved on. Um, that's... I, I'd be the first person to admit I've had some frustrations um, with the time frame that Hanover is involved. Part of the reason for that is the sheer number of people to interview. It's, it's as simple as trying to arrange an interview with someone may take weeks and indeed months if they're overseas and the next step of the investigation may hinge on that interview so it stops until that interview happens so given the number of people and there'd be 50 60 70 people that have been interviewed in Hanover thousands upon thousands of documents that have been analyzed um, it was inevitable it was going to be a long investigation I'd like it to have been shorter but I wanted it to be right do you have enough resources to pull off an investigation of that size Oh, we've certainly got enough resources to pull off an investigation the size of Hanover, um, but the reality is when you investigate something of that size, it diverts resources from elsewhere. I'd like to touch on some of the other cases too. Um, you have had some success. Rob Patricevich, are you comfortable with that sentence? Our sentence was perceived probably publicly as being a six-month sentence. In reality, it was a seven-year sen seven sentence. In other words, there were back-to-back -back 
trials involving Mr. Petrizovic and Mr. Roost. Uh, in respect of the former Securities Commission charges, they received sentences of six and a half years each. What the judge in our case was effectively saying that had our charges stood alone, they both would have got sentences of seven years. But because there was an, an, an existing sentence and an existing conviction, six more months were added. So in that sense, yes, we're, we're very happy with it. OK. Um, Christchurch looms large, we know, as a city that is vulnerable to serious fraud. And there's been conversation around this during this week. What can you do, or can you only really act after the fact? No, that was the mistake that I think collectively law enforcement and regulators made with finance companies. We mopped up afterwards. It's incredibly important that we don't mop up afterwards. We act now, we act in a very uh, coordinated fashion, and we act in respect of what we know to be the problem. The problem is at the moment we're not sure what the problem is, but we have every reason to believe uh, unless New Zealand is some unique anomaly in the world that post-natural disaster you have fraud and you have fraud on quite a big scale. There's three elements to what we want to focus on in Christchurch. One is around public awareness, to get people to speak up, to come and contact us, uh, police or other agencies if they see things either within their work or just publicly going on that they have concerns about. Um, we want to use intelligence a lot more cleverly uh, I think Peter Dent was, was talking to you earlier this week saying that you need to analyse data and the sheer volume of data that happens after a natural disaster means you have to be more sophisticated in the way you look for anomalies that might suggest fraud. And the third and most important thing is if we hear something, we've got to act quickly. When you talk more about, when you talk about in intelligence, do you rely on informants? Do you rely on paper? What do you rely on there? Um, it, ca it can be as unsophisticated as hearing something in a pub from somebody who is reliable that warrants some further inquiry through to taking all the insurance data, for, as an example, mapping that across um, uh, mesh block data and, and, and statistical data and saying, why is this particular block getting insurance payouts way in excess of all the blocks around it? It may be that it was the most damaged block, or it may be that the, incess uh, the insurance assessors in that case are taking kickbacks and have deliberately pushed up the price of the that's, assessment. That's extraordinary. So some of these tips can come from just a conversation with someone, you know, in a pub or someone in the know. It's, it's from the network, if you like. It's New Zealand. Um, people knew that the finance co companies were, were doing bad things before it became public. It's New Zealand. We know what's going on and we want to encourage that culture. It's, it, it seems a little bit of an anathema to New Zealanders to, to in some people's minds, snitch. But if people are committing crimes, you need to tell people about it. And it's very, very rare that people commit crimes without someone know, knowing there is a problem happening. What triggered you then to investigate the Wellington Tenths Trust? Uh, that was actually the concerns coming out of that were quite public. Um, there was an earlier tax fraud trial mm -hmm. and uh, the Crown solicitors down there who were involved in it and they saw things that concerned them greatly, gave us documents that were public and it was pretty obvious that um, there were some issues there. Now certainly since then people have come forward and, and I think that's one of the most encouraging things about the relationship SFO has with the public now, that people are very willing to come, and, or at least some people are very willing to come and talk to us. And um, again, if we don't have publicity around this, people are not going to contact. So if people know we're investigating something, then they'll pick up the phone or send us an email and say, look, I, I need to be interviewed by you people. Do you imagine there'll be a prosecution soon? Oh, it's far too early to even comment on that. OK, lengthy investigation. By nature, um, our investigations are not overnight things. There's, there's, there's lots of care needed, lots of documents to look at, and always lots of people to interview. All right. Adam Feedy, thank you for your time. Thanks a lot.